words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The movie, The Da Vinci Code, great adventure. This work of fiction contains mystery, murder, secret codes, and the supposed descendants of Jesus. However, great fun as it is, if you've seen the movie, you may recall a scene where one of the characters beats himself as a form of penance and spiritual discipline. It's a troubling scene, not only because of the pain suffered, but because of how a distorted a view of the Christian faith it portrays. Over the centuries, many Christians have believed that the body is somehow corrupt, and it must be diminished in some fashion for them to become more spiritual. Hair shirts and self-flagellation come out of this belief. But while moderation and avoidance of material gluttony are appropriate, these are different from saying that our bodies are somehow actually evil. In fact, we know from the opening chapters of Genesis that everything God makes is good. We also know from the opening chapters of John that God so loved the cosmos, the material world, that he gave his only son. We hear over and over again in scripture of the value and the love that God has for our physical existence. How have Christians come to believe otherwise? Largely, it is because of passages like the one we hear today from Galatians, where Paul says, if you sow to your flesh, you will reap corruption the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life in the Spirit. So Paul appears to create this adversarial relationship between flesh and spirit, which has often been interpreted to mean needing to deny and debase our bodies. Is this true? I think the answer lies in the distinctions the Franciscan Richard Rohr makes between what he calls our false self and our true self. In short, he says our false self is our ego. It is the external things that we believe to be true about ourselves. On the other hand, our true self is essentially our soul, our eternal self, the self who you are in God and who God is in you. Our true self cannot be changed or lost, but we do often fail to recognize it. And Rohr defines our false self as, quote, your launching pad, your body image, your job, your education, your clothes, your money, your car, your sexual identity, your success, and so on. These are the trappings of ego that we all use to get through in an ordinary day. They are a nice enough platform to stand on, but they are largely a projection of our self-image and our attachment to it. In other words, your false self is in you apart from God. False serve, self serves a function, a point. But when we start to believe that that false self, our education or our money or how we look, is who we really are, life becomes destroyed. When we believe that our self-worth is wrapped up in where we went to college or how much money we make, what our zip code is, that we are living in our false self. This makes our self-worth really fragile. A dip in the stock market, public humiliation, a layoff at work, 
we can feel our lives are over. And we believe our egos, our false selves, are our real selves. We spend our days walking on eggshells, fearful of the, this external image we alter. I remember 15 years ago when I separated from my first husband and showed up at my parents' door with two kids in tow. There I was, 43 years old, unemployed, divorced, single mom, living with her parents. It was humiliating. My ego and self-worth took a big hit. Without all the usual markers of achievement, who was I? We can take Moore's understanding of our two selves and apply them to this earlier question about Galatians. Because Moore suggests that when Paul speaks in Galatians about flesh, he's not talking about the material world or our bodies. Paul is speaking about flesh, what Paul's really talking about is the false self. The self that operates in this material world. Paul isn't condemning the body, but rather the ego, the false self, which must be set aside in order for us to see the true self. We don't need to beat our body but instead move beyond our ego. So that another way to read this Galatians passage might be, if you sow to your ego, you will reap corruption from the ego. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap eternal life from the spirit. Paul is trying to get us to move from a focus on our ego we're focused on our true self in God, our eternal self, our soul. So this dichotomy isn't between body and spirit, but between ego and our true self. He writes, Jesus and most other great spiritual teachers make it very clear that there is a self that has to be found and one that has to be let go of that can be renounced. Earlier in Luke, Jesus says, For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. Jesus calls us to transformation, which involves losing and dying our old life, our ego, our false self, and embracing our true selves in Christ, the eternal, deepest self. The goal of the spiritual journey is this transformation. Letting go of ego and instead knowing, knowing, we are, you are eternal beings loved by God. And nothing you do in this material world can change that. Once we know who we are and whose we are, Rest of One of my favorite movies is the romantic comedy Notting Hill. You've ever seen it? Apparently, it's an old movie these days. Nothing good is new. But anyway, in it, a lowly bookshop owner played by Hugh Grant and a movie star played by Julia Roberts fall in love. But the Hugh Grant character is from a different world than the glamour of Hollywood. And he finds being with Julia Roberts as much as he loves her. That her the accoutrements that come with her being a movie star is daunting. And he doesn't know that he can continue having a relationship with her. She finally says to him, quote, the fame thing isn't real, you know. And don't forget, I'm, I'm ju also just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. 
she is pleading with him to see that her false self, her career in Hollywood, isn't the real her. And that her true self is the one that wants to Lord writes, inside your true self, you know you are not alone. You foundationally belong to God and the universe. You no longer have to work to feel important. You are intrinsically important. I promise you that the discovery of your true self will feel like a thousand pounds of weight falling from your back. It continues, you will no longer have to build protect or promote any idealized self-image. Living in the true self is quite simply a much happier existence, even though we never live there a full 24 hours a day. But you henceforth have it as a place to always be back. What a gift. This transformation, this knowledge, means we don't need to achieve anything to be loved by God but simply claim our true identity, which is already there. Oscar Wilde once famously quipped, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. In our gospel, Jesus says, rejoice only that your name is written in heaven. You have already arrived. You are already good enough. We can drop the ego and know ourselves. 